So I'll turn things over. All right. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Happy Monday. Sounds like I'm coming through the mic. Is that okay? Is it too loud? Everybody good? If at any point I'm like way too loud or way too quiet, just interrupt me and let me know. Um, okay. All right. So, so far this semester, we've looked at film and cinema through a variety of different genres, different perspectives. Um, early on, especially, we were kind of thinking about media studies, the technology that was available at particular times for capturing moving images and for exhibiting those. Um, obviously, it's classes history of global cinema. So we've thought about a variety of like socio historical contexts for, again, the production, exhibition, distribution of films um, across the century. Uh, we thought about gender and sexuality studies, for instance, thinking about like the concepts of the male gaze. We've looked at film through narrative cinema, um, through art cinema, through auteur theory, national cinema. So today we're going to be thinking about another lens through which to look at filmmaking, um, health humanities, which is one of my kind of areas of research. So hopefully you weren't too confused when you saw the reading that was assigned, basically an introduction to health or medical humanities. If you haven't had a chance to look at that, just do be sure to look at that um, at some point this week. But we'll kind of touch on a very basic primer of the health humanities and how we can use that to kind of frame any discussion of film and cinema. Basically, what kinds of questions or concerns do people in the health humanities bring to film or cinema? Um, I don't usually do this, but this will come back around. Um, I do want to give kind of a content warning for today. We're talking about health humanities, which means we're talking about health. We're also talking about illness, injury, disease, death, and trauma. Um, so there may be difficult or upsetting content that we're going to talk about or that are included in the slides. Um, there will be references to sexual assault as well. So these are tough topics to confront, but they're important to confront. I don't think we can just shy away from tough topics, but again, maintain self-care. If you need to step out for a few minutes, just please do so. Take care of yourself. And again, Professor Johnson already mentioned paper number four. Also, I think course evals just opened today. So just to put that on your radar, um, they close on Friday the 28th. And I think they'll have two, right? One like for the whole course, one for your recitation. So it's a little different. Please, please, please do those. Um, be, be honest, but be kind because I've seen like colleagues cry about them. So please do them. Um, all right. So thinking about the health humanities, right? Um, what is the health humanities? What do we mean by that? It's basically an interdisciplinary field that tries to bring um, humanistic concerns to the world of health and medicine. And again, this is going to be really simplistic because this is not a health humanities course. Um, so we're thinking about taking concerns and tactics from realms of literature, philosophy, religion, and even some of the social sciences into the world of health and medicine. And again, that introduction um, to the health humanities reader hopefully gave you kind of a primer of the how, the why, the what. Um, I just want to couple, mention a couple key texts and concepts here, um, especially if you're interested in learning more about this stuff. So what do they do in the health humanities? What do scholars do in the health humanities in general? So somebody like Elaine Scarry in 85, thinking about the body in pain and how we actually conceptualize pain as a human being and how we articulate it. Um, somewhat connected to this, Eric Cassell in 2004, thinking about the nature of suffering um, and that pain and suffering aren't necessarily the same, right? So you may wake up and you have a pain, um, but then there's also added suffering because you're not sure like, what does this pain signify? Is something wrong with me? Whereas if you work out and you come home and you're in pain, like, you know, that's what he calls pain with a purpose or an explanation. So that's pain, but not suffering. And there's a lot of interesting work being done in those fields, um, even in terms of how one form of suffering can exacerbate another, or um, medical treatment can actually exacerbate suffering. You may cure someone's um, ailment or disease, but if a side effect, this is a story he has in, the, in his book, um, there's a violinist, a concert violinist, and she has an illness, I forget exactly what, um, she is saved, her life is saved, but she has nerve damage as a side effect of the treatment. So there's a new form of suffering here because her identity, very much grounded in being a violinist, is kind of over. So kind of weighing the different forms of treatment and how we can um, ameliorate symptoms while also not like making suffering worse. Arthur Frank discusses how illness is a call for stories. We'll get back to this in a little bit, but basically the idea that illness disrupts our lives and kind of mandates that we respond to it with a story. Um, Arthur Kleiman, writing in 1988, talks about illness narratives and the importance of telling one's story of one's lived experience with illness. Thinking about the patient who, at least going back to the 80s, 70s earlier, the patient often being overlooked 
and um, forgotten, right? But the patient is the expert of their own experience and telling that story um, has a variety of social goods on an individual and collective level. Um, and then finally in 06, Rita Sharon kind of coins the field narrative medicine, which is thinking about both the power of illness narratives, but also how it's important for healthcare practitioners or caregivers to apply holistic treatment. So instead of just looking as a patient based on their condition, kind of understanding their narrative, their life story, kind of thinking about holistic personhood. So again, just a few kind of key concepts that are kind of gonna ground our approach to thinking about film. Um, especially, we'll talk a bit about narrative and fiction film, but we're mostly gonna focus on documentary film. So again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just me trying to quickly sum up kind of the major goals in the health humanities. Um, and some people use the term medical humanities interchangeably. We're not gonna get into that debate. I don't wanna get caught in the weeds. Um, but basically we could break it down into kind of four main goals here. So we can think about, first of all, improving the clinical encounter. One of the early problems was that medical education and practice tended to focus just on biomedicine, on the condition rather than the patient or the person. So trying to bring humanistic inquiry into med schools to help improve that clinical encounter between a patient, someone suffering, and some kind of caregiver, to provide more empathy, to bring the human back into the world of medicine. Again, providing them as like a holistic person understanding their narrative. Um, and that's kind of where medical humanities focuses, just on the clinical encounter. But other scholars have pointed out, like, not everybody is a patient. Not everybody who is struggling with health or illness um, has access to care or is going to seek out care for various reasons. So scholars in the health humanities also try to theorize notions of pain, suffering. Um, what do these things mean? Some of these things seem very intuitive or obvious, um, but that's what like critical studies does, right? Um, thinking about the notion of embodiment, our relationship to our body, just take a moment and just be aware of where you're at in your body right now. Are you a mind floating around in a body? And if your mind went into a different body, would you still be you? Are you thinking about these concepts of how entangled our bodies and our minds are, um, and kind of thinking about that strange way in which they're enmeshed to create our identity. What does it mean to exist limited in a body? They also explore social determinants of health, um, basically external factors that influence health outcomes. So again, we're being really like simplistic here, but a very obvious basic one is um, socioeconomic status, right? Someone, um, your health outcome, your access to care, even perhaps your quality of care is going to be influenced by your socioeconomic status. People who have, who don't have much money are going to find it harder to get care, to do preventative care, to do regular checkups, to even live a quote, healthy lifestyle. So thinking about all the various external factors um, that are wrapped up in one person's identity and how that influences care and health outcomes. Because one of the problems with this focus just on biomedicine is that not all patients are the same. Again, this feels obvious, um, it wasn't always so obvious in the scholarly discourse a few decades ago. Even if everybody has the same supposed condition or illness or injury, they're all coming from different backgrounds with these different social determinants of health. So they can't all be treated as the same. They're not a condition, they're a person. Um, and kind of tied to this, thinking about interrogating these socio-historical constructions of health, race, sex, gender, sexuality, disability, et cetera. When we Again, just internally take a moment, like what do we mean by health? What do we mean by healthy, right? When we define that as a culture or as an individual, we're implicitly defining what it means to be unhealthy or not normal. Um, so we can think about different ways in which, again, like race is a social construct, right? It has tangible real world um, life or death consequences, but it is a social construct. So health humanity scholars seek to like go back and think about how these social constructions have kind of um, been enmeshed in the medical industrial complex. All right, so again, that's a very quick primer on health humanities. Again, I've just pulled a couple quotes from Jones, but overall the main point here, one of the problems with the clinical encounter is this focus on biomedicine or um, a common trend you'll see, maybe not as much now, I think med schools are getting better, but um, doctors referring to patients by the condition. So not Mr. Jones in room 32, but oh, I've got the cancer in room 32. I've got the gunshot victim in room 12. I've got the appendectomy in room 16. So trying to focus on treating not the condition, not even the patient, but the person, trying to do a more holistic form of care overall to improve that clinical encounter, which also statistically improves overall health outcomes. Um, all right. 
Rita Sharon also, she's quoted here in the piece from Jones, um, talking about narrative competence and narrative medicine. I think this is an important thing to consider, especially in the context of today. Um, so narrative competence is what humans use to absorb, interpret, and respond to stories, right? All humans are typically um, attracted to stories, and that's how we kind of understand the world. This enables the physician to practice medicine with empathy, reflection, professionalism, and trustworthiness. Such a medicine can be called narrative medicine. Again, understanding the story of someone's life beyond just their condition. So we can think about a couple other um, things to think about. Arthur Kleinman, thinking about illness narratives, claims the study of the experience of illness has something fundamental to teach each of us about the human condition with its universal suffering and death. Kind of a downer quote, but a way to think about this, I mean, everyone in this room has somehow been affected by illness or injury, whether directly or indirectly. Um, if nothing else, we have all in this room survived a global pandemic. So we have all been influenced by illness or injury. Again, some more directly than others, even if that pandemic never happened, still everyone in this room has been injured or sick at some point. Um, half of my students have been sick all semester long. I hope you get better. Um, so again, we are all connected though through this universal experience. So there's something fundamental to understanding about humanity by exploring um, expressions of illness, sickness, injury, et cetera. Um, Arthur Frank and the Wounded Storyteller, basically he's kind of borrowing from another scholar named Roy Schaefer. Um, he talks about self stories. These are the stories we tell ourselves about who we are, right? So we narrativize our past to make sense of where we are in the present and to help kind of make a plan or future story for, for our future, to anticipate a story for our future. And Arthur Frank makes the point that illness or injury, any kind of serious like health concern disrupts that story that we tell ourselves, right? My past was not supposed to lead me here. What do I do now and how do I make a plan for the future? So one of the ways to confront this um, is thinking about narrating the story of our illness. In one sense, Arthur, uh, Frank claims telling that story can help us kind of regain control of our lives, reconstruct the self story, that's his term. I think he's borrowing it from Schaefer actually. Um, regain control of our lives and regain our sense of self. Right? Suddenly our life trajectory has been disrupted. So we have to kind of integrate this event um, into the story that we tell ourselves. In addition to that though, so there's a sense of healing, there's a sense of therapy there, but um, in some other seemingly intuitive ways, telling a story of your illness is just, serves many other like socially good purposes, right? Um, telling that story, making it public or sharing it, distributing it is another way to just inform others, make people aware. Other people who maybe aren't familiar with your condition can su suddenly um, learn from your expertise of lived experience of illness. It's also a way, we'll come back to this too, to either call for justice, um, or create some kind of catalyst for change, especially in terms of problems with the medical industrial complex or just other injustices that are like involved with health and medicine. And it can create solidarity among those who suffer. Um, going back to Eric Cassell, who talks about suffering, one of the other things he points out is one form of suffering is just having some kind of health condition or concern and feeling isolated. Like you're the only one, like nobody understands it or nobody is acknowledging it. Um, so one way to create solidarity among those, to allow other people to feel seen, represented, is by spreading your own story of illness, injury, et cetera. So it serves both like an individual good um, in terms of helping you heal, work through what's going on, but also it can have all of these other kind of more collective or societal benefits. Um, I do have time. So I might play, I'm not going to play the whole thing. But a quick example in terms of just informing people and thinking about the best ways to, to kind of spread these messages, right? A written text, a short story, those can be powerful. But we're thinking about film and cinema, and I want us to think about how film and cinema is uniquely positioned to like combine and play around with genres and mediums um, to really engage people, right? And first, if you're going to get your message out, you have to keep them engaged, um, and that takes like some creative and aesthetic decisions. This is an example of a filmmaker who's actually an epidemiologist, and he kind of realized, I'm publishing in these medical journals, the only people who read them are other scholars. They already know this stuff. We're in an echo chamber, nothing's changing. How do we make changes? We influence policymakers, lawmakers. Well, that, that's not happening. So how do we get pressure on them? We inform civil society, lay, the lay public. They're not reading medical journals, but damn it, they'll watch a movie. So he kind of um, apprenticed under a series of other filmmakers and started making documentaries with the express idea of spreading awareness to other members of like the lay public, non-experts, who would then eventually put the pressure on lawmakers and make things change. 
So this is a clip from his um, first film. Again, thinking about a combination of mediums, we have, um, we're about to hear a spoken word poem written for the film. So we've got the, the visual medium of what's literally being captured on screen. We've got the audio of the sounds and noises. I want you to think back to that reading a couple weeks ago about like noises, ambient noises, not necessarily part of the, the soundtrack. Um, and then also obviously the content of this poem. And again, think also just about the visual choices in terms of what to, how to shoot this. Do you know what it feels like to have a machete taken to your lungs? To hold a drill in your hand for so long you forget it's not a part of your body. To work in a place where light at the end of the tunnel is more than just a figure of speech. Welcome to the mines, where men work so far underground that sunlight is manufactured from headlamps and golden soot, where the sound of breaking bodies is drowned beneath a cacophony of hollow coughs and hammers, where disease festers in the air as if the earth were holding a grudge against mankind for failing to keep her secrets. In the South African gold mine, the reality of tuberculosis can make every breath feel like a death sentence. The toxic dust from million-year-old rocks like a swarm of dancing landmines along the walls of your ribcage, a bombardment of bacteria crawling through your throat tsunamis, of silicosis and sweat crashing against shores of black backs like a crystalline whip. So these men, with cobblestone skin, jackhammer hearts, and jawbones clenched like redemption, expose themselves to a world of disease and degradation unlike anywhere else on Earth. How ironic that the industry responsible for the success of South Africa's economy is also culpable for a pandemic wiping out thousands of her people. These are the consequences of corporate indifference, where executives unwilling to part ways with a pocket change percentage of their profits enable illness to run rampant in a community they are supposed to protect. With golden clocks hanging in their offices like stolen halos, they refuse to provide real care for the very people who created their wealth. So why would anyone subject themselves to this? But what choice does a man have when he has to feed his family? When jobs are as scarce as roses on a crumbling battlefield, when he knows his wife and children can't survive off of unfulfilled promises. So he puts on his heart, turns on his light, and marches miles beneath the earth amongst blocks of brown faces, with no choice but to pummel his heart against the walls of this mine as if he were searching for his dignity. And when the miners are deemed too sick to work, they are simply sent home, like disposable human tools that have lost the sharpness of their edges, with HIV and tuberculosis cascading in a spiral-bound pirouette through their bloodstream fathers, falling in the eyes of their children, praying they don't succumb to the same fate, lying on deathbeds made of debris and lost hope, screaming at the top of their lacerated lungs, I am sick, I am tired, I am dying. Imagine your father choking on the inevitabilities of his past. Your mother, widowed by the misfortune of other people's apathy. Your brothers and sisters, settling for a future that seems all but inescapable. How much longer can we watch as generations of black men are cycled through a system that treats them like dirt? How much longer can we simply watch them sent home to die. All right, so that was a long clip, but I realized there's really no good place to interrupt that in the middle. But again, um, we can think about, again, combinations of media there, right? That poem, it's a spoken word poem. It's meant to be performed. Um, that poem would not be nearly as effective without hearing and watching his performance. Um, the way we can combine media, we can also think about just the visual style, the soft focus when we're looking at Clint Smith in profile. Um, we can think about, I forgot to mention, this is obviously about gold miners in sub-Saharan Africa being sent home with latent TB um, and like corporate indifference. Uh, they broke into a gold mine to do this. Like they did not have permission. They, they hopped a fence, filmed it, and said, we got to get out of here. Um, but that's very intentional, right? They, they went out of their way. They broke the law to make sure they had those ambient noises of the mine in the background um, and to make sure we could even see the mine and the machinery um, in the background of that delivery. And for the sake of time, I don't want to linger on that too much. There we go. Um, all right. So again, we're going to focus mostly on documentaries today. Um, but... I did want to at least kind of acknowledge some narrative and fiction films. I tried to pick out like popular ones that y'all would be familiar with, but we can think 
Um, these films are also touching on different health or medical concerns or inequities, right? So one flew over the cuckoo's nest in 75, talking about mental health and how we as a society define normal behavior versus aberrant behavior, um, and actually even confronting like literally how we treat that. Um, but not all these necessarily include the clinical encounter, like a doctor and a patient. We've got the deer hunter in 78, right? Um, narrativizing like PTSD, combat trauma. Rain Man in 88, a lot of people's first like mainstream introduction to autism. Um, Philadelphia in 93, calling attention to the HIV AIDS crisis um, among the homosexual community at the time. Patch Adams, not a great movie necessarily, but I included it because um, it, is illustr it illustrates what's going on in the mid 20th century in terms of medical education. Again, very much with that biomedical focus. We're focused on the disease, no empathy, no humanity. Uh, but we can even think about some of the films we've looked at this semester, like so Pathra Panchali, right, Durga, she dies because they are poor, they can't really get access to sufficient health care, and because they can't repair their home. Um, Ram Surat, right, again, dealing with poverty, dealing with, we have the one scene with the couple trying to go to the hospital, um, because the wife is pregnant, and I think it's very intentional that that, that little excerpt or portion of the film is like very slow, it feels like a very long, slow ride, to the hospital. And obviously they can't afford something more expensive. There are automobiles in that area. They just don't have access to them. Um, or even something as experimental as daisies. Um, we could think about towards the latter half of the film, there's that collage scene where they're making collages and then they literally start like cutting each other up and, and they become collages themselves. From a health humanities perspective, one could argue like that's maybe a commentary on how like bodies, especially female bodies are kind of themselves constructions, collages. Right. If you can take something apart, it implies it's been put together before. It's a construction, socially defined. So again, just thinking about some of the work that different narrative or fiction films can do, but I want to mostly focus on, we'll skip this clip from Patch Adams. Um, we'll think about documentaries. We've been thinking about documentaries off and on throughout this entire semester, starting with Lumiere Brothers and other actualities. Right? At the beginning, they were just trying to capture reality in a moving picture. Right? Oh, look, we're going to set up our camera, and here's people leaving a factory, or here's people getting off a ship. Um, we've thought about travelogues, this chance for people who may never leave their home, otherwise finally getting to travel via these films. Um, early newsreels, education or instructional films. Um, we talked about Soviet cinema and documentary. And then I just want to remind you all about, you know, third cinema, Solana, Solana Singatino, talking about documentary filmmaking as the closest we can get to true revolutionary filmmaking. So again, just kind of trying to remind you of some of the readings, some of the content, some of the stuff we've been talking about previously, thinking about documentaries, right? This attempt to film, to capture, to document reality, which is kind of a paradox we'll come back to. But also I wanna remind y'all about some of the problems or contradictions here. Um, so even thinking about travel logs, we discussed briefly the problem with exoticism, right? The fact that someone goes to another country and is just kind of filming, um, in a way, kind of objectifying. I mean, even the act of filming itself is literally taking a three-dimensional person and flattening them out into a two-dimensional moving image. But this idea of objectifying um, the, quote, foreign, the other. Uh, we've seen it in a couple pieces, and Susan Sontag mentions it as well, this problem with the metaphor of the camera as a gun and the filmmaker, cameraman as hunter, right? Even the language we use. Get that shoot that, capture that, right? Um, there's very, something very eerily similar between like hunting and filming or ph photographing. Um, Susan Sontag claims it's inherently imperialistic or at least an act of like othering. But documentaries also have uh, the potential to do social good. We've already touched on the way stories themselves can do that social good, informing others, creating empathy, perhaps catalyzing change. Um, in the nature of thinking, especially about like trauma, we can think about the power of witnessing and testimony. Um, and these are not necessarily like, I'm not using this in like the legal sense, but um, these are more like scholarly terms in terms of narrating one's own trauma or atrocity that's happened. So again, it's been well documented that the power of telling your story is um, an effective way to work through one's trauma if done correctly, right? The act of reconstructing that narrative, going back to Arthur Frank, um, if illness disrupts the stories we tell ourselves of who we are, then trauma is the most extreme disruptor of that. It threatens our very sense of identity. Um, and so it almost requires this eventual reconstruction of the narrative of what happened to integrate it into your own life story. And that has both like a personal benefit in terms of like therapy and healing and working through trauma, but also there's this sense of kind of this collective good 
almost a moral imperative to, to narrate your own trauma. Um, Judith Herman says, remembering and telling the truth about terrible events are the prerequisites both for the restoration of the social order and for the healing of individual victims. So both it's necessary for someone to heal, but also in terms of actually like calling to justice, calling for justice for this atrocity, this event that's happened. Um, the conflict between the will to deny horrible events, typically from the perspective of the perpetrator or those in power, and the will to proclaim them aloud is the central dialectic of psychological trauma. So again, if done correctly, this can be restorative in a variety of ways. Um, I'll show just a brief clip from A Girl in the River, The Price of Forgiveness. Um, this is an example. I'll, I'll give a quick context here. It's in Pakistan. This young woman, Saba, um, married without her parents' permission. Uh, the family felt um, shamed. They, they felt dishonored, and they wanted to both punish her and bring honor as they saw it back to their family. So the uncle and father retrieved her from her in-laws, um, and they beat her, they shot her, and they left her in the river to die. She survived, and the rest of the film kind of focuses on like pressing charges, the arrest, what's going to happen. There is a form in which like close relatives can actually forgive and remove the charges for such a crime. And there's a debate about whether or not that's going to happen. This story is told a couple times in the film. And then finally we get to this point where she finally narrates what happens. Um, so we can think about both the content, the power, kind of there is a sense of empowerment in her telling this narrative in this way, but also the visuals, right? In terms of how they're actually presenting this, I think is interesting. कुरान खोलिया इन्होंने उपर हाथ रखा कुरान दू जान बाद हाथ रखा ठीक है लड़की कुछ नहीं कहते हैं इतो फिर कहना नानका मेरे को लै गया सामने ट्यूबा करा गया ट्यूबा चाहता सी चलो ठीक मेरे दिल से मैं कुरान एडा वा चुकिया है कि मेरे दिल से कोई जिला शिकवा नहीं है गल थोड़ा सा लाया ना ही उन्हें ग्डी खिला रही है ग्डी खिला के चाचू मेरे पहले मैं चपेड़ा मारते रहे पहले मैं थले मारते रहे हैं मैं माँ थे ये इसको पहले मुझे पिटाई कर रहे चपेड़े मारे हैं मुक्के मारे हैं लेकिन मैं बर्दाश्त कर रही हूँ बातें कर रही हूँ खुदा का का पर बहुत ज़्यादा इनकी आगे इन्होंने मेरी बात नहीं मानी नहीं सुनी है इन्हें दिमाग के उत्ते इंज नज़दीक रखी दिमाग के उत्ते रखी है तो मैं थोड़ा सर इंज किया बस थोड़ी गर्दन हिलाई है थोड़ी सारी थलू इंज संघ चाचू ने संघ दबाया मेरा कहना ला मार तो मैं लेकिन थोड़ी सारी इंज गर्दन दर दबाई है अपनी तो लेकिन इधर इन्ना इन्होंने इसी मार गई है इधर लाके फिर उन्होंने त्रोड़े बोड़ी च बंद करके मैंने नहर च फेंक दिता चिड़े की फिर तह नहीं आने लगी लोगों को पता ना चलेगा नहर में जब इन्होंने मुझे फेंका था लेकिन आस्ता आस्ता मुझे होश आई थे लेकिन मैं उधर से बाहर निकली दूर से एक बाइक थी कि मुझे बत्तियाँ नजर आई उसका मैंने उसके पीछे मैं आस्ता आस्ता चल चल के गई और एक पेट्रोल पंप के मुझे बत्तियाँ नजर आई मैं वहाँ गई थी So again, uh, this story has been told a couple times and finally she tells it. Um, again, there's limited strategies you have for documentaries, right? You can film events in real time. Obviously they were not present for this, but later in the film, they follow her like to court and moving forward, deciding how to react to this situation. Um, you can interview someone as they do here. Uh, you could rely on archival footage to fill in gaps um, or you could do a reenactment, which are often kind of cheesy. And especially if you're reenacting like the worst moment of someone's life, it feels a little disrespectful. Um, so in this case, they kind of intercut this faux reenactment, right? We're not seeing human figures, we're not seeing actors, um, but we're seeing through her eyes, her perspective. When she says that it was nighttime and I was in a car, suddenly the filmmaker, the cameraman is in the backseat of a car, right? Or down by a river or walking through the woods towards a gas station. So I think it's just an interesting, very subtle tactic where when she's finally telling the story for herself, um, we are, when we intercut away from her, because it could be a little boring just watching her for several minutes telling the story, right? There's, that's another aesthetic choice. They choose to cut away and kind of give this faux reenactment. Respectful, but we're seeing literally through her perspective of that experience. I think really highlighting, again, they're not here to necessarily tell her story, but kind of help her tell her story.
Um, at very at many times throughout the film, she also says like, um, it's important that I tell this story. It's important that you make this film. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. So again, going back to that idea of testimony, a call for justice, both for her individually and kind of collectively. But responsible filmmakers and responsible consumers of media and consumers of cinema should be aware at least of some of the pitfalls, the potential dangers. Again, this isn't exhaustive and this is not necessarily all strictly limited to cinema. Um, any kind of work can be misappropriated or misunderstood. Again, going back to Susan Sontag, she talks about how you could have one photo of a battle scene and one side will take it and, and celebrate it. Look, look, we're victorious. The other side could take it and use it to say, to condemn. Look at how horrible our enemies are. And it doesn't matter the original intent behind that photograph. Um, or again, it makes me think of, uh, I don't know, when the film Joker came out with Joaquin Phoenix, some people said, this looks awesome. Other people said, is it a great idea to make a film where we're kind of valorizing and romanticizing like a white male domestic terrorist? Um, so we can think about different ways that one piece of content begin, can be interpreted. Um, viewers can experience vicarious trauma. So even someone who has never suffered something similarly um, can empathize and identify so much with the people they're seeing in the film that their experience watching it is almost the same as actually experiencing it. And thus they can actually um, have symptoms of PTSD. Now, to be clear, this is different from just being like upset, disgusted, repulsed. Um, this is like a little bit stronger than that. I think we have a tendency to throw the word traumatized around a little too loosely and dilute it, but it is possible. Um, my next point is kind of why I wanted to make sure I gave that content warning at the beginning of this lecture. People who are survivors watching a film can be triggered by those events, right? They can feel like they are re-experiencing it because they're watching it in the film. They're more susceptible to that. Um, again, a very simplistic uh, uh, example would just be uh, many combat vets could not watch Saving Private Ryan because literally it felt like they were right back there. They would have flashbacks, intrusive memories, et cetera, strong symptoms of, of PTSD. Um, but we can also think of something more subtle. What happens when you take one person's life and tell a story? And in a way, you're kind of reducing or defining that person by the one experience that happened to them, right? Um, you're kind of falling into that trap, going back to just treating someone according to their condition or their illness, right? This person is just the gunshot victim. This, this young woman is just the woman who was thrown into a river and survived. Um, now, this film does a pretty good job of exploring like other aspects of her life. Um, it's, it's a lengthy film and it's well worth a watch. Um, but that is a trap people can fall into, reducing someone uh, based on their experience or making someone become a symbol of a larger problem. And they're no longer really treated like a human. They're just a symbol, an icon, a martyr. Um, and this can also, you can end up like dominating the discourse, right? If you make a film, the film about topic X, and that's what everyone thinks about. So suddenly the film takes the place of the discourse. It forestalls further discussion. Um, and the film almost comes to like, just represent that topic. Um, even though it's just one perspective on that topic. Uh, it's very, it's, it's possible that if someone speaks out publicly, they're involved in a film, they speak out publicly about violence or atrocity. It's a basic fact that like they could be retaliated against um, in a variety of ways. And then participating in a film can be potentially traumatizing or triggering for a survivor. So asking someone who's gone through a trauma to sit down and narrate the story of what happened to them can itself obviously be triggering because they're literally reconstructing that narrative but they're re-experiencing it at the same time. So these are some potential dangers that we'll kind of think about quickly because <laughs> oh, we're running a touch behind. Um, but real quick, going back to the idea of reducing someone for stalling discourse. Um, this is Hector Peterson who died just shortly before his 13th birthday um, from the June 16th uprisings in the Southwest Township near, kind of near Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, this is his sister. He is being carried away. This is an iconic photo. Um, and eventually a museum was made to Hector Peterson and, and the other youth who died during this uprising. Um, and in one of the exhibits, there's actually several quotes from his sister who's like, everyone, to everyone, this photo is iconic. And Hector came to like represent this whole uprising and this whole injustice. To me, it's just my brother. And to me, that day is just the day my brother died. Um, she wasn't even aware, like no one, nobody here was like even aware of the photographer. So we can think about iconic photographs or iconic films even that kind of could potentially fall into that trap, again, of defining someone just by their condition or just by the nature of their death. Um, or they become a symbol for something larger, but we forget about the human being behind that symbol. And again, that can forestall further discussion. Um, going back to the idea of being triggered, like during an interview, right? Giving testimony or witnessing can be powerful and empowering and healing if done correctly. 
Even when done correctly though, there's still always a risk of triggering and upsetting and causing potentially psychological harm. So like the first question should always be like, is it worth it? Is this film going to do heavy lifting and real social good? Is it worth the potential of like causing some psychological harm, asking this person to re-experience what they've gone through? Um, I'm not gonna show you a clip of someone like breaking down during an interview because that would feel exploitative. Um, I'll quickly tell a story. Uh, this was a film about this woman, Tembi, in Eswatini, which used to be um, called Swaziland. She's very public and open about the fact that she's HIV positive. And she's now working as like a community counselor. She helps people educate members of the community about safe sex and getting tested and getting to the clinic, getting access to ARVs. Um, in 2019, we went to do a film um, focusing a very short documentary film about the HIV AIDS crisis in Eswatini. It's gotten a lot better in the last 20 years. Um, but we wanted to tell that story and specifically like kind of her story, her kind of trans transition. She was in a coma for a long time, declared dead, and then eventually like recovered, is on treatment, and is now like helping the community. So we did a very short film. We met with her for like a pre-interview. So we got to know her, created a rapport, some mutual trust, um, kind of went over what the project goals were, how she wanted to tell her story, kind of the general idea of the questions we'd be asking and how she was going to answer. And we came back a couple days later, we were partnered with the CDC for this, for funding. And we're not gonna get into funding, but that's all other can of worms you can consider in the back of your head, what happens with these partnerships, especially with like governmental or non-governmental organizations. But the two folks from the CDC um, tagged along. Even, and we said like, you're not part of the crew, like please be quiet and stay out of the way. And we asked a series of questions and Tembi at one point just kind of casually mentioned that decades ago, she'd been the victim of a sexual assault and she quickly moved on. Um, it is not how she contracted HIV. Um, she almost looked like she didn't even mean to mention it. And it was not something that had come up in the pre-interview. And even though that was like a horrible moment in her life and thus like unfortunately important to her, it wasn't directly relevant to this story that we were trying to tell. And again, she had not agreed to talk about it in advance. And so that's also a place where it's tough to find balance, right? We're here to kind of embrace the holistic personhood of this person we're interviewing. Um, but we're also, we're not making it like an, an autobiography or a biography, right? We can't cover everything. So how do you embrace who they are when you realize you can't tell everything? Some stuff's going to get cut. But we, we just, she quickly moved on. Again, almost looked like she didn't mean to say it. And one of the CDC people like poked the interviewer and like handed him a slip of paper they had like hastily written something on. And the interviewer just kind of ignored it. And she kept poking him, which is distracting for everybody. And we finally finished. And we're like, Tembi, are you pretty happy with, you know, what you've said? You think we got enough to tell your story? Yeah, yeah, so we're starting to close down, and this is going to be jarring, but this is kind of the point, so I apologize. The CDC person just goes, so can you tell us about the sexual assault? Like, super casual, super just, like, almost like, hey, what's the weather out? You know, like, what should I wear today? Um, and we all just kind of stopped and were flabbergasted. Um, we should have interrupted the question. That's what she had been, like, handing the interviewer, like, ask about this. CDC folks knew we weren't going to include that in the film. It was not relevant. The film was only like five or six minutes long. Um, they later admitted they just thought this would be an opportunity to get another useful clip for a potential future project. If they were doing something about like women's health or sexual assault problems or violence in East Watini. So they literally forgot about this person's humanity and just saw them as like the source of a potentially, a potentially useful clip. Um, in a very callous way, just like casually throwing that out there to a survivor and expecting them to narrate and go through this experience um, of, of like reliving one of the worst days of their life. Um, so that's just a personal anecdote I'll never forget. Um, the CDC does great work, but some of their representatives are, are problematic. But for the sake of time, we should move forward. Um, all right, we'll skip this. I included the film with Tembi just for context in case you're interested. Um, I do want to quickly think about how do we like approach this, right? A lot of it's been about balance, right? Recognizing the full personhood of the person you're interviewing, kind of the same way we encourage doctors to recognize the personhood of a patient or someone who's just struggling with a condition. Um, how do we remind people too that there's this inherent paradox with documentaries, trying to capture reality, but also realizing like it's still a construction. Some stuff's gonna not, you're not gonna include everything you film, and also um, the editing room itself, right? We're splicing stuff, we're moving things around. Sontag points out that with photography, and I would argue it's true of filmmaking too, it's always the image that someone chose. To photograph is to frame and to frame is to exclude. So the next time you're watching anything, like pay attention to what's in the frame, but also ask yourself what's out of the frame. Who's speaking and who's not speaking, et cetera. Um, so even documentaries are making aesthetic and creative and political choices in terms of what's going to be included. 
so we we see a trend in later postmodern documentaries with this kind of self-reflexive nature, calling attention to themselves as constructions. Um, we've seen this in a few pieces already that we've looked at this semester, but they often integrate the filmmaking process into the content of the film. Um, sometimes this is logistical, right? If you're dealing with like a somebody who's just not, some people don't give good interviews. I don't give good interviews. Um, children don't usually give good interviews. The answers are very short, stilted. So you almost have to, like, we have to hear the interviewer ask the question so it makes sense. But there are other ways around that. Like, that's still a choice that the filmmakers made. But a lot of times, too, they're trying to be transparent. Sometimes these films almost become a story of the making of the film itself um, in a way to kind of toy with the very distinction we have between, like, fiction and um, uh, reality or re reality and art, truth and fiction, et cetera. So in terms of thinking a person-centered cinema, we've kind of already covered all this. The main thing is the film needs to be a force for social good. Every choice you're making, ask yourself kind of, is it worth it? Is it worth asking this potentially damaging question to this person? Um, is the film actually gonna do some real heavy lifting in the real world to make a change? But for the sake of time, I'll quickly show a couple things. So this is an instance, again, about that reflexive documentary um, filmmaking. Um, they got, basically, they're on their way to, the two filmmakers are on their way to interview a woman who survived or is in treatment for um, extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis, the side effects of the treatment, one of which is she's now completely deaf. Um, on the way, they're kind of getting their camera equipment set up and checking the settings, so they're actually filming each other, getting B-roll without really meaning to, um, and they're concerned about the wind and the audio. I don't know if we can do it. John, you bought the headphones. You want to listen to it? Is the wind blowing? Yeah. I don't know. It's going to be tough with the wind. Uh, the, the audio on that won't work at all. It's way too. Yeah, you can still do it with something else as well. This one here. Oh, the reason why you are you losing the earth, you are using the phone is that I can't hear them speaking. So now I have to read what he's writing. So I hate to cut that off for the sake of time. We kind of get the point. There's there's more to it than that. But the main point I think that moment makes, they chose to include that, right? They got so wrapped up in like the filmmaking, just like let's get everything set. Oh no, we're outside, the audio is gonna be terrible. For a moment, they kind of lost sight of the story they were there to help someone tell. They lost sight of like the person. She's just kind of standing there watching them like worry about the audio things and they forget like they're seeing the world through the perspective of someone who is not deaf or a member of the hard of hearing community. And they've kind of forgotten about her personhood a little bit. And I think in this, they're kind of calling themselves out for that, bringing attention to it, inserting themselves into the film. Um, and we actually see like writing on a slate to communicate with her and they make that part of the narrative. Um, all right. When I'm going to take some injections, I just like, I'm nervous and I'm shaking. And do you show that to the other students or do you keep it to yourself? I keep that to myself. Why? Because they don't have to know. I have to be strong. She's the oldest, um, child at this TB I'm so afraid of TB. Because when they die, the students don't have to know I'm shaking or maybe I'm scared for the injections. Is this uh, canamycin? Amicacin. Amicacin. Uh, this, this all though is, um, it's for the tablets. And this one is for, um, for the injections. I don't know the other ones. Mm -hmm. I still have a long way to go. I see myself in break sometimes, and sometimes I don't. Again, they've inserted themselves a bit just because her answers aren't always great, but also to show the rapport and trust since she is a child interview subject.
but they make a choice here. They want to communicate how painful the injections are, but they also don't want to kind of exploit um, like a young girl in pain who's screaming. So we don't see it, and we only hear the very beginning of a scream, and then it turns into that kind of distorted ringing. So the communication is there um, without, again, like exploiting or becoming voyeurs to like a child in pain. And then we have this, for the sake of time, I might cut it off, but we have this kind of hopeful moment where then she recovers, gets up, and then kind of goes on with her day. But it's uh, day 14 out of 180 injections. Um, we won't play this, but this is definitely worth, I've got a clip here. I'll add um, like timestamps before you get the slides. Um, this is a, a documentary um, about Indonesian mass murder in the 60s. And this filmmaker actually finds the people who did it and gets them to reenact scenes, like reenact their like, uh, uh, acts of violence for the camera. It's very bizarre. This clip, he's going around like recruiting townspeople um, and being like, you're going to play the mother who's terrified that I'm about to burn your house down. And it suddenly shifts from that to he's actually then reenacting it. And it for a moment, it's very unclear. Again, this filmmaker's toying around with reality versus representation. It's very unclear. Like, wait, is he actually attacking her? Oh, okay. He's, he's reenacting this. It's very bizarre. Um, we're, I know we're almost out of time. So let me see if I can get this to move forward. So I'll just leave you with some questions to consider thinking about weighing the benefits and costs of creating a film that can serve a social good, but also does have inherent dangers. Um, thinking about how we represent bodies, illness, the other in any form, in any kind of media. And again, any implications that some of this stuff may have in terms of like the roles of new media, where everyone's kind of going around constantly documenting um, their lives. So yeah, I guess we're pretty, um, Professor Johnson, did you have any last announcements or anything? Okay, yeah, so I think the quiz is up or will be up soon. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. And uh, I'll stick around in case people want to chat about this more. Have a great rest of your day.